All right, I have the great privilege of opening God's Word with you on this series, Connecting with God for the month of January. Could there be anything more important than connecting with God? Obviously not. Connecting with God is the most important thing. It is determining what, really how we are being shaped in life. It is affecting what we are becoming more than anything else is how well we learn to connect with God. So here's what I wanna do for the next few weeks. I wanna not just talk about the importance of connecting with God, but I wanna get real practical to help every one of us connect with God. How do I connect with God? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this scripture as our theme verse. So if you're physically able, come on, let's stand up together for the reading of God's word. John chapter 15 says this. This is in the red, by the way, in the, in the New Testament, means Jesus said it himself. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, there's connection, all right? Connecting to God. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then Jesus makes this statement. Apart from me, you can do nothing. How about that for encouraging? But it's the truth. Anything we do of significance in this life will only be because we connected with God. And so we want to talk about that today and actually over the next few weeks through the month of January. How do I connect with God in a meaningful way? Today's thought is coming from the first four, four words of the Bible, Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God. God is supposed to be in the beginning of everything. When God's in the beginning, He's in the middle working out the mess. So we're gonna talk about how do I get God in the beginning? If He's in the beginning of the relationship, if He's in the beginning of the marriage, if He's in the beginning of my day, if, he, if, if I connect with God before I send that email or before I send that text, how many of you know everything gonna be better if I connect with God first? And so we're gonna talk about that concept today. But here's what I want to do while you're standing with me is over the 21 days of focused prayer and fasting, we meet together on Tuesdays. Six, we'll meet this Tuesday, six o'clock for one hour. And then we meet every Sunday. And the two times that we're together, I want to pray. Tuesdays, of course, it's really all prayer. But today on these 21 days, I want to take a couple extra moments and I want us to pray together. I want us to pray about our connection with God and our fruitfulness. I just want us to pray because Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And if you don't know how to pray, then just listen, you'll learn. Come to our prayer meetings, by the way. Show up. You're like, well, I don't know how to pray. I don't wanna, come, how do you learn? Show up and we'll help you learn how to pray by just being a part of the prayer life of our church. So let's take a moment. Can you pray with me today? Jesus, thank you for the gift of prayer. I and we together as a church are so grateful for this gift that you gave us. Prayer was not given to us just to be a discipline. It was given to be a delight. You gave this gift to us so that we could connect with you. So we dedicate these 21 days to you as a church and we pray you'd help us to connect with you in a deeper and more meaningful way than maybe we ever have. We pray for our to be more fruitful this year than she's ever been. We wanna see you do things we've maybe never seen you do before. We wanna thank you for all that you've done, but we wanna ask that you would continue to move in our midst. God, we don't take what you're doing for granted. We recognize that everything that we see being done and lives being changed from the young to the old and people being born again and hearts healed and relationships restored, it's only because of you and it's because you gave us this gift called prayer and that this is a house of prayer and people are praying for one another. And so we ask, would you stir prayer in our hearts? Come on, pray with me. Don't act like it's Sunday morning. Pray with me. God, will you stir prayer in our hearts today and over this 21 days that God, that we would learn to pray in a more powerful and deep way. God, we wanna see you do miracles. Can you agree with me on that? We wanna see miracles this year. We want to see more this year than we've ever seen before in our lives and in our families and in our children. We pray, God, where there are needs that we would see needs be met. We pray for your presence where there's been a lack of it in our life. Meet us in this 21 days. Do something 
that will cause us to praise you even greater than we did today. We pray all of this in Jesus' matchless name. And everybody shouted amen. amen. All right, high five three people and then you may be seated. I was watching football last night. I don't know how many were watching football last night, but as I was watching football last night, I was, I was overjoyed. I was thankful as I watched hundreds of players and coaches kneel in circles around on the football field before the game began, praying and seeking God. And, and of course, I'm, I, I don't like that it is on the heels of a tragedy. And from, uh, was it Monday night's game, I believe? Many of you are, maybe saw that. But, but God has been answering prayers even in the football player's life that needed to be resuscitated last Monday. And, and, I, and, and on that event there, you saw teammates kneeling and coaches leading in prayer. And, and it makes it, I'm like, oh, thank you, God, that somewhere down deep in the root of our nation, somewhere, somewhere still in the heart of humanity, when we hit tragedy, we know where to turn. We drop to our knees and we turn to God when we know we need a miracle. I'm grateful for that. But, but I'm here to tell you this, that prayer should be our first response and not our last resort. Prayer is given to us to be something that we don't just cry out to God in tragedy and although he's there for that, but it, but it's given to us to be our first response. So before I send the text, before I go to work, before I go on the vacation, before I take off on the trip, before I go to bed at night, before I get out of bed in the morning, prayer to be that first response response out of our life rather than just our last resort. That's why we dedicate times like even this at the beginning of our year to prayer and to fasting. I got a secret for it to share with you. A secret to a happy and fulfilled life is with this scripture that I started in Genesis and that is in the beginning God. It's to, God is supposed to be at first in our life. He's supposed to be our first one that we turn to. Our first love and everything in the Bible my friends is built on this principle. Everything in the Bible is built on the principle that God is to be first. In fact, the first commandment is, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. What he's saying is, is, is that you can have other things, obviously, that you're, you have hobbies and you have things that, that you like to do. That's all fine. But what he's saying is, is that there is to be nothing in first place other than me. That's what this commandment is about. He doesn't mind us having things that we enjoy doing. I have hobbies that I love to do. And I honestly believe have been gifts from God for me. They've been gifts to restore me and to replenish me and to, to kind of reset me. But even those, God says, listen, don't ever let any of the stuff I give you, even your own children, to take first place over me in your life. And the principle of first runs throughout the Bible. As we read, the Old Testament starts in the beginning God. God is trying to let us know that he is to be in the beginning. And the New Testament, as I open up my Bible, not only in the Old, and I open up Genesis chapter one, there it is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, God wrote the Bible. And then I go to the New Testament. And just in the Gospels, right, right in the beginning, where John begins to write his letter, he says words like this. He goes, oh, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. John is copying Genesis chapter 1, trying to let us know that God is to be the beginning of everything. 21 years ago, when our church bought our first building to call our church off 3rd and Poplar, we had about six months remodeled it. We wrote scriptures on the wall. Of course, every church probably does that. We did it here too. It's like behind the walls or scriptures all over and on the floor, by the way. So you're walking on the word of God everywhere you go. But in that, when we had our first building, because this principle I saw throughout the Bible 21 years ago, I realized, you know what, God, I don't, I want to be sure that the first word that's ever on a microphone is not welcome. 
glad, to, glad you're here. I didn't want the first word to be anything other than God. And so we, we didn't even open with somebody giving a welcome. We just let the worship begin and the, we chose a worship song that had Jesus as the first word of the worship song. So the very first word that was ever sung in a microphone in the first building that this church ever owned to call its own was Jesus. Because we see the principle of God to be first throughout the Bible. And whether you're a Christian or not, your life is marked by whatever you allow to be first. Whether you're a Christian or not, your life is marked by your Priorities. So I'm trying to, to communicate today that first things matter. First things matter. And if I'm going to learn how to connect with God, then I have to learn the principle of first. I have to learn for God to be in the beginning. I have to learn for God to be first in my life. And right after that first four words of the Bible, you just flip the pages, a couple pages, and you see this principle again in Genesis chapter four. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So it sounds like a good thing. He's, he just out of his heart wanted to give God something. But Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Look what God thought about both offerings. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Why? Because Cain, in the course of time, brought some, but Abel brought the first. And so God's letting us know right in the beginning, God, and when you even bring an offering, it, it, it is just as important when I bring it as it is what I bring. So it's like, I'm, I'm bringing God the firstborn before I even know how many more I'm going to have. I bring God the first, where Cain was like, in the course of time, when I feel like it, when I've got time, when there's leftovers, I'll bring some of my life to God. So here's what I want to tell you. I want to give you, I want to give you five areas, five areas of how we can apply this principle of first in our life and then show you what happens when we do. You ready for God's word today? Yes. Here we go. So the first thing is I, I want us to get is that give God the first of everything. Give God the first of everything. In other words, I don't have God in a box in certain areas of my Sunday life. I don't, know, I don't just have a Sunday morning worship experience. I don't have a Sunday relationship with Jesus. How many of you know relationships and marriages do not work that way? Hey, I'll see you on Friday night. That's when we will be together the rest of the week. Hey, it's, it's all mine, whatever I want to do. No, no, I give God the first of everything. In fact, Leviticus talks about the tithe this way. It says, Tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, it all belongs to the Lord and it's holy to God. So the word tithe means 10, 10%, but holy means to set it apart. And I think the principle goes beyond money. I think the principle that God is wanting to get across to us is I need to be first. I need to be the first of everything in your life. In fact, the tithe is given for that reason. Deuteronomy in the Living Bible says it like this. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. So I just want to encourage you. If you don't tithe yet, tithe for one year. Try it and you will see that God is good on his word. But the real principle is about first things first. So give God the first of everything and give God the first of your year. This is why... We take somewhat of a tithe of our year at the beginning and we dedicate one days to prayer and to fasting. We will meet the next three Tuesday evenings at six o'clock for one hour. We're really strict about our time. We stay 60 minutes, that's about it, up to 63 sometimes. But we're pretty good. We're really good about our time and your time really, that's why. I say that because I understand it's busy. Some of you are coming straight from work. You get here and there's hundreds of us here. 
praying on a Tuesday night and sometimes we break up into small groups and we pray some there and we worship and we cry out to God and we pray prayers from the microphone as well. But all of it said and done, I'm here to tell you that God answers prayers when they're prayed. You got to pray a prayer in order for it to be answered. And so we have something called prayer, uh, prayer and fasting for the first 21 days. Now I realize that some of you don't even know what fasting is or aren't familiar with what fasting is. Fasting literally means to abstain. And I want to give you some ways to fast and, 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 and show you some of the ways in the Bible that what fasting is. So we have our 21 days of prayer, just talked about that. Uh, one, one way is, is a complete fast. Now in the Bible, this is a primary, primary way of fasting and it calls for drinking only liquids. So typically water with light juices as an option, but something like this, I don't recommend without some type of medical supervision and just bottom line, use good plain sense on something of this nature. Um, but that's pretty much what a, a fast in the Bible refers to when it says that Jesus fasted 40 days and afterwards he was hungry. This is the fast that it was talking about is that Jesus went without food for 40 days and was tempted by the devil and beat up on the devil when the devil tried to deceive, you know, Jesus into some sort of seduction of being, you know, all that crazy deception of the word that the devil used. But Jesus was in a complete fast during that time. Okay, that's one fast that's in the Bible. Here's another one, and, and it's a selective fast. Now, this type of fast involves removing certain elements from our diet. And the best example would be Daniel. Daniel uh, fast was removing meats and sweets from his diet. So pretty much consuming water and juices and fruits and vegetables. So shop at Andy's. That's pretty much what the selective <laughs> fast is. So Dan, or some people call it the Daniel fast. So that would be a, another way to fast. You got complete fast and, and, and selective fast and removing items from your, your food list. And then there's something called, uh, that we're going to call the partial fast. This is sometimes called the Jewish fast. And this is where you would skip certain meals. So you miss breakfast and lunch and then fast all day and then eat the evening meal. So that would be the, a partial fast. So you got complete fast and selective fast and you have partial fast. But here's one that I wanna encourage as many of us to do and it's called what we're calling a soul fast. What I mean by a soul fast is any area of our soul that is being fed from culture. So that would involve media, movies, news, um, maybe a lot of TV, except for the football playoffs, because God's all about <laughs> that, of course. He, he gets it, because Jesus is a Seahawks fan, and he wants to watch himself them win today at one, and if they do, then Jesus wants me to watch the Packers lose at five, because it's the only way for the Seahawks to get into the playoffs, and the Lord wants me to do all that today. I know that to be true. So, but there is a lot, I think, that we benefit with a soul fast when we talk about maybe social media and TikTok reels or or Instagram reels. Are they called reels on TikTok? No. no. See, that's how, what are they called? Just TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I don't have TikTok. Um, all of that stuff that you know about. And just like for me, I've been kind of recently, the last several months actually, getting into the, these, the reels on, on Instagram. And so I thought those were TikTok because you told me last night, Mariah, that like, that's like TikTok. So that's why I said that. But anyway, um, <laughs> But I'm going to drop it. I'm going to drop it, you know, being on, I don't really, I'm not on Facebook much anyway, but I'm going to drop being on Instagram. And I'm not going to, so just a soul fast. I'm not going to check on, my, on the news. I figure if the world's ending, somehow I'll find out about it. Um, <laughs> it'll get to me, right? The information will make its way to me. Here's the point of all of it, is to replace those times, whether it be meals or media, replace those times with extra time in the word of God and in prayer. The point is to, to just have a reset and to have a time to, to, you're, to have more time to be able to seek God. And you will be amazed. I promise you, if you've never done it, if you've never done a soul fast and dropping some of the, the extracurricular activity in life, 
like, like social media and news and such, you will be amazed at how much time you have and how many books you can read while you're in the bathroom and stuff like that. You'll be amazed at all the time that is given to you. So spend extra time in God's word when you fast. All right, so what I'm saying is, is the principle of connecting with God is, begins with the principle of God being in the beginning. So let God be in the beginning of my year. Give God the first of everything. Give God the first of my year. And then another way to connect with God in the beginning is to give God the first of my week. That the first of your week is Sunday. On, in Acts chapter 20, it says, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. See, listen, being done here at 12.05 every, every Sunday, that's, that's 11 hours and 55 minutes. I still got to go scripturally. I got, I got time. <laughs> but on the first day of the week, they came together. And here's the point of it. Now, see, Sunday is a work day for me, but it's not for most of you. So use it as, as a day, as the first day of the, of the week where you can worship God you can be replenished. You make a commitment to be in church and then take the whole day. Give yourself a permission to take a nap. I mean, have a day off and really replenish. Give God the first day of your week. It's one of the ways where I put God in the beginning and I make God first. So how do I connect with God? This is what we're talking about, is I make sure God's in the beginning. The beginning of what? the beginning of my year, the beginning of everything, and the beginning of my week. This is how, I'm, I'm, sh I'm showing us how do we practically make God first rather than just it be a statement. Yeah. Is I give him the first of my year. I give him the first of my week. And too many people, even in the early church, started to lose the priority of giving God the first day of the week. And so Hebrews comes along and says, hey, no, no, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. See, habits begin to get formed because we just think, oh, it's not that important. And then when you create a habit, you lose the ability to be encouraged. So the, some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. So when I set the whole day aside to rest and to replenish and to refocus and to gather together and to worship God with the body of Christ, I'm here to tell you, God's gonna do some stuff in your life this year that is dependent upon him being first. All right, so give God the first of everything. Give him the first of your year. Give him the first of your week. Let me give you something else here about how I connect with God and making him the beginning of everything. I give God the first of my day. I want to give, Lord, give the Lord the first of my day, the best of my day. Let me give you a statement. You will never change your life until you change something you do daily. Everyone in here does some things every day without thinking about it. There's some things you do every day. You go to the coffee pot, you turn it on, you make your coffee. This is what you do. It's the first part of your day. There's some habits you have. Some of you have planned those out. Some of you have not. But again, I want to remind you, whatever is first is influencing your life the most. Is Starbucks influencing you the most or is God influencing you the most? Yeah. All right. So giving God the first part of my day, I want to show you very, I just want to break this down to make it so everybody can do it. Everyone can do this. No matter how busy you are, I believe everyone can find a way to do this. Give God the first 15 minutes of your day. Give him the first 15 minutes. And let, let, me, let me show you how to break that down. Give him five minutes in the Bible, five minutes in worship, and five minutes in prayer. Now, if you're going to do the daily Bible reading and get through the Bible in a year, it does take longer than five minutes. But if you're like, I can give 15 minutes, then I'm going to break down it even more, even more clearly on the Bible. You're not going to be able to get through all of it, so here's what I encourage you to do. If you're going to spend five minutes in the Bible, spend it in the New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs. Spend, if you'll get five minutes in, in some of the New Testament, some in Psalms and Proverbs, it'll be a good place to start. All right, that's in the Bible. Now what to do? Five minutes in worship. 
So rather than other media, rather than checking the news, rather than checking social media, then how about five minutes in worship, turn on a worship song, go through one worship song in the morning before any other sound hits your ears. Five minutes in the Bible, five minutes of worship, and then five minutes in prayer, and I'm gonna break down prayer for you even. Have some thanksgiving, thank God for all that he is and all that he's done, and then let your requests be made known to God. How about that? Be thankful and give some requests. All right. So this is how, rather than me just saying God's first in my life, this is how I prove God is first in my life. He gets the first of my year. He gets the first of my week. He gets the first of everything. He gets the first of my day. That's why Paul, discipling a young pastor, goes, I urge you, first of all, pray. I'm urging you, Timothy. Here's the first thing that I want you to do. And I'm thankful that the first pastor who brought me on staff, that that he taught me this principle. Because I didn't know anything. I've been to Bible school, but I didn't know how to pastor. I didn't know how to lead lead people. I didn't know anything other than I I knew some stuff about the Bible. So I show up, I'm serving, and I asked him right when I showed up. And I said, what do I do? And he goes, here's what you do. First thing in the morning, when you show up, read the Bible and pray. That's what I do. So I thought, okay, that's what I'll do too then. And he spent, I think it was at least an hour in the Bible and in prayer, maybe even longer than that in the morning. And so I thought, I'm just going to be doing whatever the pastor does. And so that's how I learned. One of the ways I learned to give God the first part of my day is because my pastor didn't say, hey, I want you to start meeting all these needs and go do that and go check up on who, whoever needs to be checked up on and go to the hospital and pray for them. He said, no, 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 no. First things first. Pray and read the Bible. So if I'm going to give God first, then I'm going to give him the first part of my day. All right. Last but not least, I'm going to show you what happens when we do this. And this actually is age. It's an age dependent point. So I'm going to speak to young people for a moment and I'm going to let you define who's young in the room and (laughs) Let it apply to your life. I'm going to make God first. I'm going to give God the first of my life. I'm going to give God the first of my life. So I'm not going to wait until I'm later in life. Until I'm done with college, then we'll serve Jesus. You know, God, you understand, listen, you know, it's high school. This is hard right now. And so come on, just give me some grace. I'm going to just hang out with, do what all they do. And then when I'm done with high school, then I'm going to, I'm going to give you some attention then. You know, Lord, after my twenties, I'm going to be settling down. You know, things are going to be slowing down for me anyway. And you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to begin to really make you a priority in my life. Give God, if God's going to be first, give God the first of your life. You only have one chance to do this. And I know every old person in this room that waited to give their life to God until later are amening me right now to every young person saying, don't wait till you're old to serve him. You don't even know if you'll make it to then. That's why the writer in the Bible in Ecclesiastes said this, remember your creator in the days of your youth. It's before the days of trouble come. How about that for a promise? (laughs) Put that on your refrigerator when you finally buy one, young person. (laughs) Days of trouble are coming and years are gonna approach when you say, I find no pleasure in them, (laughs) ouch. When do you seek God when you're young? Now, it's good to seek God when you're old. I'm not saying that. I mean, if you didn't seek God until you're you're older, then praise God. The best time to start seeking God is right now. And give God the first of the rest of your life. But I came here to talk to some young people for a couple moments. Some people in the teenage years and in their 20s. So I just defined it for you. Some people in their teenage years and in their 20s that are hearing this either today or later. God gave me this word for you. Do not wait 
to go after God until later in your life. This is the time for you to give God the best of your life. Give him the, the, the youthfulness of your life. Go after him like you've never went after anything else in your life. Get somebody with you at our Youth and Young Adult Conference because at that conference, somebody is going to go after God like never before. My mother taught me to go after God without telling me, I'm teaching you this at 12 years old. Go after God when you're young. She didn't tell me to, that. She just knelt by my bed every single day, year in, year out, years. My mom knelt by my bed and prayed with me. That impacted me as a young boy. And I began to understand, you can go after God when you're young. And I learned now that I'm old, dirt. <laughs> that whatever patterns you set when you're young will most definitely help you as you grow older. If you will learn to go after God when you are in your youth, you will most likely always go after God all the rest of your life. I didn't say attend church. I said if you'll go after God. Now, I think if you go after God, you'll show up in church. But I'm not just talking about just being in church. I'm talking, I'm going after God. I'm going after God. God gripped me in my later teenage years. And in my 20s, I learned to go to a place called the boiling room. It was the basement in my first church where I began to serve. And it was loud enough that I didn't have to worry in, in, in concrete walls. I didn't have to worry about anybody hearing me. But I went down there and I cried out to God. And I learned how to pray. And I learned how to seek the face of God in my youthfulness and in my youngness and I, in my 20s and in my late teens. And I was, I was like, God, I want you. And I want more of you. And I want to learn how to see, see answers to the prayers that I'm praying. And I'm here to tell you, one of the reasons that I'm still here decades later is learning a pattern of praying first as a first response rather than a last resort when I was young. There's something about setting patterns in our life and giving God the first of your life. Oh, please, young person, hear me. You don't see your 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s yet. You think it's so far off. And if God would let you to live that long, it's sooner than you think. But I'm here to tell you, you set up blessing for yourself in your future. If you'll go after him with everything you've got, even if your friends aren't as passionate about God as you are, go after him. Find someone. I believe God will give everybody at least one. Young person, God has one other. Elijah was a prophet thinking he was the only one going after God. And God's like, I got 7,000 of them. So you may be in your high school and you may be in your middle school and you think there ain't nobody else that serves God or loves God like I do. That may or may not be true, but I'm here to tell you, I promise you this, there's more in our city going after God like you than you know of. You may not know this church, but we have several different discipleship programs in our church. We have our impact on Thursday nights that you can sign up for starting late spring and early summer every year for seven months for adults after, after high school of any age. We also have our Bible college, which you do know of, and that is after high school, 18 to 25, and we disciple people there. But we also have something for our middle, school, middle schoolers and our high schoolers that is called Prime. And Prime has 31 or 32 students in it showing up early in, in the afternoon, right after school, being discipled in the, world, in the Word of God and getting a biblical worldview, going hard after God, right here in our church, middle schoolers and high schoolers before youth group ever starts. So, that was a little preachy, sorry. Go after God in your youth. Seek Him when you're young. What Daniel did it. 
And I don't have time to preach about Daniel, but you should read about Daniel, especially if you're young. Daniel didn't bow to the culture's gods. It's, it's, it's a tremendous story about his life. He was a teenager, by the way. But here's what you can expect to happen. When you seek God and you put him first, pathways are going to appear in your life. Because life will be full of left and right turns or choice A and B. And it's not always a choice of sin and not sin. Sometimes it's two good choices. And you just don't know, do I take this class or that class? Do I go to that college or not go to college? Do I go to a tech school? What, is, what are my choices? There's all, do I date her? Do I not date him? Do I, what, who do I date? Who do I marry? What, do I take that job or that job? Which job do I take? Do I, what do I do in all these choices of life? I, here I want to tell you to do. In the beginning, God. And if you put God in the beginning and you'll pray first and not as a last resort, this is what's going to happen. God will make the pathway clear. He'll, he'll direct your life. And this is a promise, a promise out of God's word, out of Proverbs chapter three. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. So it's not about what you can figure out, pros and cons and checking the list. And I'm not against that. Do it, but then get God in the beginning. Get God in the, in the midst. Put him in. If you'll do these, like he gets the first of everything. He gets the first of my year. He gets the first of my week. He gets the first of my day. And he gets the first of my life. Then this is a promise for you. Seek his will in all you do. He'll show you which path to take. Listen, I've been doing this long enough following Jesus where I have watched this promise unveil in my life. And I mean paths that made a difference about whether I stood on this platform or not. Paths that made a difference in the destiny of my life. And it was only because my parents taught me Pray first. Get the Bible in you first. And you know the story if you've been a part of our church. But I was graduating Bible school. And I, had, I didn't know which path to take. I didn't know where to go. And it was from reading God's word that God showed me, call your parents. And they're going to have wisdom for you. And they did. And they showed me the path to get back to Walla Walla. I, you know, when you're 22 years old, you, you just think Walla Walla is a small town. Never want to go back to a small town. Come on, God's got great things for me. You know, can't happen in a small town. So dumb. Anyway, <laughs> God was like, he showed me the path. He showed me the path. And then throughout my life, major decisions and small decisions. Oh, I wish I had time to talk to you about some of them, but I don't. Here's another one. Expect provision from God. Is there anybody who has sought God first and seen, seen God do this promise in your life that you have seen provision happen? Come on, so I give God praise. Will you do that right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's why. Because it's a prom promise out of God's word again. Honor the Lord with your wealth. With the first. If you honor him with the first, then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Where's my, where's my keyboardist? I'm looking for you. Did you hide? Oh, you're back there just loving Jesus in the back. <laughs> when you give him the first fruits, your barns will be filled to overflowing. You don't have a barn, but you get the point. Your vats will brim over with new wine. You might have one of those. I don't know. But the point is this. When God gets the first, he says, you can expect me to take care of you. I will take care of you of you when you put me first, when I'm in the beginning. And last but not least, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. This is Matthew chapter six, which is the same chapter where Jesus taught us to pray. It's called the Lord's Prayer, which I'm going to teach you in two weeks. In this chapter, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is in the context of teaching us to pray. He says these words. When you seek first, when I'm in the beginning, then everything you need, all these things, I'm here to tell you, you can expect in the context of prayer, you can expect your prayers to be answered. You know why? Because when God's first, he gives me the right desires. And now my heart is inclined to what he wants. And now 
pretty much most of the things I pray, they're in line with His will. And I can just expect my prayers to get answered. How many are ready to have these kind of blessings pour out in your life? Pathways to appear, provision to come, and prayers to be answered. If I'm going to connect with God, my friends, if you're going to connect with God, then in the beginning, God. God needs to be first. And I do that very practically by giving Him the first of everything. The first of my year, the first of my week, Sunday mornings, the first of my day, give Him 15 minutes, and the first of my life. If I'm not young anymore, then today He's getting the first of the rest of my life. Will you stand to your feet? Somebody today is going to give God the first of the rest of their life. Some young person is going to say right now, I'm giving God the first of my life. I'm going after him like I've never went after anything in my life. I'm going to go after God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. I'm going to share him with everybody I know. I'm going to fall in love with Jesus and he's going to become my first love. Somebody else has passed their youthful years and you go, this is all I got left and God goes, I'll take it. Give me the first of the rest of your life. I want to pray for us to make God first, and then I'm going to pray a prayer for everyone in the room that is not sure if they, or online, that is not sure if God is first or if God is at all in their life, and they want to make Jesus Lord. Can we take a moment and pray together? Jesus, I pray for my friends today. I pray for everybody in this room and those online, and I ask that you would help us to put you in the beginning, to make you first. We want you to be the first of everything in our life. Show us what area where we should begin. For some, some young person right now, they are dedicating their whole youthfulness to you right now. Somebody's saying, I'm taking Forge next year. I'm going after God. Begin to stir some hearts. Make some commitments to give God the first. Maybe for somebody that's past their youth, but they're saying, God, I want to give you the first of the rest of my life. I want to go after you like I've never went after anything in my life. Take these commitments and grace us. Help us to know what fast to be involved in. Help us to know how to pray every day, how to be in the Bible every day. Lead us. We want you in the beginning. With every head bowed and every eye still closed, if you're in this room or you're watching online, do not be distracted in this moment. The most important decision you will ever make is making Jesus the Lord of your life. Yes, he wants to be your savior, but he also wants to be your Lord. And if you are not sure if you're born again or you're pretty sure that you're not, then I wanna pray this last prayer before we leave. And this is your opportunity to say, Jesus, forgive me and come into my life. And if you're going to pray that prayer with me, then just whisper it right there where you are, something like this. Jesus, I pray on behalf of my friends. Forgive me. Forgive me for taking first place in my life. Forgive me of every sin I've ever committed or I ever will. I want you to be my Savior, but I also want you to be my Lord. Come into my life. I want to be what the Bible says is born again. I want to become brand new this very day. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I can live for you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' matchless name. And everybody shouted amen. Can we just give Jesus praise one more time today?